Hi, everyone. Welcome to Alatra TV UK. Today, we're here to raise awareness in necessity of building creative society and to answer your questions together with Merwin and, and myself. Please use the live chat option to express your opinion and ask related questions while watching us. We will answer them. And in this live broadcast, we will hear masterpiece life story of a special man, Marvin Abbott, and discuss how important it is to get the eight foundations of creative society embedded in our everyday life. Just to remind you, these foundations are the result of thousands of social surveys, live broadcasts, roundtables, interviews, international conferences conducted around the world as part of the creative society movement. And it's truly what all people, all people want. We people all over the world, believe me, and we are able to get united and achieve it. Just need you to stand with us. Please find more detailed information on Alatra TV sorry, on alatraunites.com, of course, and Alatra TV as well. And I invite Anne here. Thank you, and hello, dear friends. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our dear guest for today, Mervyn Abbott. Let me tell you a couple of words about him. He's a lifesaver, and by that I mean his emergency ambulance experience and survival classes that he's currently teaching. Uh, he's also a veteran of the Vietnam War. He's a great artist and one of the most talented people I have ever met. Welcome to the program, Mervyn. We're so excited to have you with us today. And I would like to ask you now to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself. Well, uh, thank you, um, Anne. And um, this, is, this is a good opportunity to uh, share with other people. Um, and I want to, uh, in, in um, recognition of the fact that tomorrow is Mother's Day, here anyway, I don't know what other parts of the world, but uh, uh, wish all, all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day. Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that we're concerned about is the whole issue of war and uh, the destruction of innocent people around the world. And one of the things that the media doesn't do is it does not show us uh, the condition of the young boys that come home, young boys and girls that come home from war damaged. If mothers could see those pictures, the war would end right away. Yeah. And this forms a foundation of, you know, we need to be more emp empathic or empathetic uh, com have compassionate upon people that have no choice in what is happening. Um, I've been, I was raised, I w my father was a sign painter and uh, mm -hmm. an artist, and I was raised with um, that influence in my background. My mother was a school teacher. And um, I remember when I was a child, before I was five years old, my mother had made some little flashcards with famous paintings on them. Mm -hmm. And my dad posed as a, for a famous artist. He's dead, both my, my father and that artist are, have passed away, but my father posed uh, for this artist. And um, so this has always been in my memory from even before I was, five years old as my as my father showed these pictures of that uh, photographs of the originals that this artist had done as a matter of fact in the background on that side of the picture th this is something that that artist did and mm -hmm. I have incorporated it into this larger picture I did this this painting in the background back in 1986 I did it in a public place in a bakery in town and um, it took me two months to do. And a lot of people came in and um, we had conversations. And uh, I, as I was finishing up the painting, that's when the Chernobyl accident took place. And um, 
So I put the uh, uh, a nuclear reactor behind the White House, uh, memorializing that event, kind of like, uh, you know, how would the White House like to have a nuclear reactor right behind them? <laughs> I think we have that picture. Those picture you kindly shared with us to show. Can we... Can, can we ask technical support? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's about 12 pictures. Yeah, these are uh, a collection of different things that I've done in the past as well as more recently. Mm -hmm. um, and That's your like inspiration. This, yes, uh, <laughs> that, I did that for my high school, a 50-year reunion, and uh, it's hanging in there uh waiting area now. This is one of my latest ones, the <laughs> elephant dance. And there's all kinds of small pictures of people in there and things like that. And I, this is a digital painting, a digital drawing here. Mm -hmm. I did that for a book. And um, this one I did, uh, it's hanging in, in uh, one of the rooms in this house. Uh, it cut it for my wife. That's and this my one, favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I call this fire and ice. I call this aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I call this best friends. And um, I see a, you know, see a lot of um, kind of like alien thought right there. Mm -hmm. The face. Um, yeah. I call this life in suspension. It's, uh, done, it's oil on, on watercolor paper. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are talented, and, Merwin. Thank you. Uh, and I call this one the loud cry. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Gorgeous. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so, thank you so much <laughs> yes. for your for your stories and for, for these amazing paintings. We are going to come back to the topic of art in our conversation today. But first, I would like to ask you another question. We know that you've traveled a lot uh, inside the US. Uh, you traveled to Canada, to Mexico. And during your lifetime, I'm sure you've met so many different people with different backgrounds of different ages, different genders, different social statuses. And the question I'd like to ask you, what do you think unites them all? What is that one common ground that you can unite, that unites all people? Well, the first thing is that we're all united as humans. But um, more than that, we are united in the fact that we cannot choose our parents, our gender, or the native <laughs> language we will learn, the nation and politics we will grow up in, or the religion we will be taught. These things divide us. Yeah. Yeah, but love and care and helping each other can unite us. Yeah. See, as you said. Yes. There, the, the very fact that we are in different places and have different languages and different cultures, those things are used by people that have power to control mm -hmm. us and divide us. Yeah, and as we discussed earlier, some you know, well, yeah, people have different living conditions. Some people don't yes. have a roof above them. Is there any fair reason for people to be treated differently? Is there any fair reason to consider some people as better and some as worse? Would you say that some of us deserve more than the others? Well, I think that there comes a responsibility. Um, I, like I heard it said, that, uh, you know, for instance, at me as an artist, I do my artwork for everyone to view and to benefit from. It's a talent. And there's also a talent for making money. Just as an example, it, there's all kinds of different, um, um, there's, also, there's all kinds of different uh, types of wealth. And if, if a person has a talent for making money, uh, they have a responsibility to the larger uh, community to benefit the larger community. 
because they are benefiting from the larger community to get that wealth. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's in the same way, I mean, it's just like a, if a person sings, if a person is a singer, what is the point of going somewhere in a, in a room by yourself and just singing to yourself? I mean, a bird doesn't sing to itself. A bird goes out and sings to the world. And flowers and, are blooming for us, not for yes, the Yes, <laughs> yes, that's all, that's nature, that's natural. And so, uh, you know, like a, a person who is a hunter, a hunter goes out and he hunts and finds a tree full of apples. So um, in a hunter-gatherer society, he would let the rest of the group know about what he's discovered and then um, share that with the rest of the community. That keeps the family alive. That keeps everybody alive. Unity and community. Yes. Yes, yes, we're we are in the consumer society, we are so focused on ourselves, it's somehow this form, it, it has divided us, has individualized everything. And yeah, we are forgetting that we are all interconnected. Yes, as you mentioned, we all have different background, different parents. Yes, we all have so many different things. But as you also said, we're all humans. And this you know, this unites us on a level, on a such, you know, deep level. We all have, you know, same desire for happiness, for peace, for love. We all, you know, have these human values in us. It just, yes, I think what, you know, the common ground, what unites us is so much more than all these artificial, uh, external, external things that divide us. <laughs> yes. You know, every day I live on the side of the highway. I, was, I live on the side of a highway. And so every day I see people going to work and back home. And just because somebody is driving a fancy new car doesn't mean they own it. <laughs> it might actually mean that there are slaves to a system that um, is causing them to, to run that like a hamster in an exercise wheel. <laughs> and uh, they're just, they hate it. They don't, they don't like to be doing it. And um, so um, it's the same thing is, same thing is true in another sense that there are people on the other side of the world that, um, that are human and they uh, get hungry. They get, uh, um, they get cold. They, uh, uh, they, they, need, they need as much as anyone else does. They need to have international compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when one country puts sanctions on another country and says they can't have uh, imported oil, for instance, or they can't have imported food, Uh, because somebody, you know, a, a, a mobster on the international block wants to control it, then, um, then what we end up happening is all these people in that area end up starving and having problems. Yeah, that's why we need creative society as soon as possible. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we get, and it's it's not something that's going to take place uh, real quickly. It, it takes these kind of things yeah. take place over time. Yes, yes, they do. But but at least we are already you know taking every every step every step necessary to come there. And, yes. Uh, I'd like to tell our viewers uh, about one post I saw on your Facebook page and it was it was an interesting question there you asked your friends your subscribers what is beauty for you and it, it's very interesting question to ask and the topic of our today's live conversation is also life is beautiful isn't it Uh, so I would like to talk to you a bit more on the topic of beauty. First of all, in that post uh, that you posted, uh, you've got so many answers. Uh, please tell us what is your favorite one and tell us what beauty means for you. Well, I think that uh, one of my favorite ones, I think that the favorite and, and kind of boils down to the idea of character. 
Mm -hmm. uh, character is a is a quality of beauty. And it is, you know, like when when you look at a painting, um, the painting is going to have the character of joy. It's going to have the character of it's going to be expressing wisdom. It's going to be expressing um, uh, happiness, or it's going to the contrary side to that. You know, is ugly or darkness or death, uh, destruction, things like that. And I think we've all seen those kind of things. Uh, it it does trouble me a lot that in society we have uh, popularized games, computer games, where people are, uh, you know, getting in, in an avatar situation and they're going and uh, shooting each other and killing each other and destroying each other. And the person that's on the the uh, giving end of that, the that's pulling the trigger, they don't ever die. And so that's kind of presents a, a to to the younger generation that kind of presents a false reality to them. Yeah, mindset. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. Now, um, as far as your other part of the question. The thing that um, beauty is based on, beauty is based on a lot of certain principles. It's just the same way with music. Mus in music, there's all kinds of principles that are involved, and they're very similar. Uh, for instance, here's a color chart. And we see that on the, on the color chart, there are arrows and on the opposite side of the circle, like for the red, there is the green. Mm -hmm. For the blue, there is the orange. Those are complementary colors. And when you use those two colors together in a painting, you can cause that painting to pop. And that's what I like to do in my artwork. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some other little keys that are part of this because... This issue of beauty is something that I have asked myself about for a while. Like, what is it that causes a particular painting to become beautiful in a person's eye? Because mm -hmm. we've all seen pictures that people post on the Internet and they, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, that's beautiful. And they'll have a love little emotion there. Um, and so um, uh, that's kind of the thought. So now look at this picture. You see, that's a that's a reflection. Yep, that's a mm -hmm. reflection of uh, of the uh, of the sky and the and the um, the trees on the surface of the water. Yep, mm -hmm. that that reflection is what we call a perfect reflection. And I'm going to I'm going to um, I'm going to read a couple of thoughts here. As above, so below. <laughs> Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. This is when we can look up by looking down. So what we can do is we can, by using a good character, we can show something about heaven, see? And earth made new. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Okay, so now here is another example, and we're talking about the the uh, Fibonacci um, mm -hmm. or the golden. Yeah. Yes, and um, so what we see there is we see the uh, concept of uh, that circle, but on the on the side that doesn't have the color and the rose in it, there's also the relationship of the title to a paragraph versus the paragraph. So the ratio of the, of the Fibonacci or the golden mean is also seen there. And so that's just an example. So, so what this does, what this, what this is, and a simple way to do it, to explain it, is you can take a picture, like when you take a picture with your camera, if you take the picture and you divide it into thirds, 
-hmm. both vertically and horizontally and put the main areas of interest in along those lines, it will be more balanced and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so now as an example, look at this. Right. Mm -hmm. See how how she's off on in a third of the picture, her face, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. her arm is over on the other side, pointing back to her face with the flower. See, mm -hmm. that's a good example of that. And you can yeah, practice. Yeah. yeah, you can practice that with your camera as you take photographs, and uh, that's actually part of also how I set up this uh, shoot here today is to mm -hmm. set it up so that there's thirds and there's things that are in the background, things that are close up. Now, look at that picture. <laughs> See, it's, we're all it's beautiful. <laughs> 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 you know, isn't it true that we all want to see people's smiles? The smile is the most contagious thing there is. <laughs> <laughs> wow interesting okay yeah. so now here, here's another thing and that is perspective everybody has their own perspective and mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see this real good but one guy is over there saying no it's a six and the other guy is saying no it's a nine, nine. Yep. Yeah. Right. Okay. so both are right <laughs> that's right Yeah. okay so now um, in the other picture uh, this is a picture that most tourists see of the synagogue on St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to show you what that picture used to look like. That picture used to look like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, is, uh, it originally was done in black and white because back at that time in 19... Um, 77, when I did it, um, or 78, something like that, um, there, the only printing that was really available at a good cost was black and white. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I did the original in pencil, black and white. And this is a print of the original, okay? And mm -hmm. some friends of mine actually bought this at a yard sale, at an estate sale, and met me one day in Ohio and gave it back to me. That's how wow. come I have it. Okay, this is a, <laughs> a print, okay? <laughs> now I'm going to show you the original. And the original, I went back over it with color. Yeah, wow. and, yeah we saw it on the screen, yeah, previously. Yes, and you see, I, I uh, got on the roof of the building across the street to take this picture. So I got a different perspective than the average person. And the original picture, when I took that picture, had telephone lines going across in front of it. And so as an artist, I was able to eliminate those telephone lines, you see. And so, okay, so the point again is that another part of beauty is in, is in contrast with color. And like with black and white, that was beautiful at one time when there was no other means to to record things but now we have color and color mm -hmm. and as it's kind of similar to the idea of people from all nations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everything is beautiful it is indeed and uh, coming back from a um, balanced beauty <laughs> to yes. education should we Yes. We previously discussed that young people are a bit disconnected from nature, to be honest, from the world, world around them. Uh, they don't know how to grow their food, how to survive, how to care and help each other. And um, how important do you think it is to live in harmony with nature, to be more aware of the surrounding world, to know and understand more about processes outside of your own walls yes um when you think about it you look at the large cities that have millions of people in them mm -hmm. and how many people in those cities actually grew up there 
or maybe in another big city, went to the school, to the high school there, and went to the college, but never grew a single plant in a garden. Um, they may have a lot of education, but they didn't get any experience in the very thing that would keep them alive. Look at all mm -hmm. the kids that, that go to the grocery store and see eggs and milk, and they think that it's manufactured somewhere <laughs> in some factory. <laughs> they don't understand that chickens come from eggs and eggs come from chickens. They uh, don't understand that cows give milk and that, cow, that, that yogurt is made from milk or cottage cheese or cheese or goats and all that kind of stuff. They don't have a clue. And you know, as they grow a little bit older, they learn some of these things. But it's kind of like it was in the old days, you know, in the country, people used to use a, a horse or, or, or oxen or whatever and pull a plow and cultivate their garden and things like that. And over time, a little bit more technology comes along and pretty soon we lose touch with how to use those old implements. And so we're really dependent then upon a tractor that uses diesel fuel to run. And we've got to have a tire company to make tires for the tractor. And uh, so, and if we, if there's a part that breaks, we've got to have a factory that makes those parts. So we become um, acclimated to that. Because we are not doing it, because we are, these kids are not learning these things, we're facing a starvation event. And um, if you were to imagine that we were on a voyage, we were going to make a, a voyage from the UK or to Europe in general to the Americas, and it was going to be on a sailing ship, on one of those old sailing, sailing ships, and it was, you know, uh, going to take two or three months to arrive there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you'd certainly want to have a lot of skilled technicians. You'd want to have skilled people on that ship that could handle every part of that ship to mending sails, to uh, uh, making rope, repairing rope. Uh, you'd want to have people that knew how to cook, how to uh, catch rainwater using sails to, to catch that rainwater. And mm -hmm. there was, there's all kinds of thought that, you know, medical things and things like that, that all have to do with uh, being on that boat. And uh, you're going to be, you're going to be defending that boat against pirates. You're going to be defending that boat uh, again, uh, against stormy weather, uh, all kinds of issues that are, you're going to be having people on lookout and, uh, and the, what they call the crow's nest up in the, top of the, ma the mast, looking out to make sure that they don't run into land and, uh, you know, ship, wreck the ship. So there's all kinds of things that are essential to making that ship. And small towns and communities like that are like a small ship. A big city is like a big cruise ship. And um, it's kind of like you've got all these people up there that are on this cruise ship and they don't know anything about what's going on in the engine room. <laughs> they don't know anything about medical stuff. All they're doing is they're out sightseeing as tourists. Uh, people that are, you know, a, um, a real big, a, a good ship is one that's going to be, have a, a lot of different talent on board. And that's what you want to do. That's, that also is another asset. That is kind of like money, okay? Uh, all this represents time, and time is money. So, so that it's the same thing with talent, whether it's music, your knowledge in the medical field, growing a garden, all of those kind of things. And all wealth begins with the, with the ground. All wealth begins with the dirt. That is, uh, that is what we're all made of. 
And that's what we're all going to end up dissolving into. Our bones will dissolve and become a part of the earth. <laughs> and so again, we think of, think of what it takes to make a large, to, to a man a large sailing ship, to go on a long voyage, lots of talent, people to cook food, uh, all kinds of mending sails and rope. Everyone is respons- is, uh, needs to be, uh, every, everyone needs to be able to defend the boat day and night during stormy seas and calm. So that, you know, this is a, um, this, one thing I would like to add to that is I want to ask you the question, who owns our seed? When you go into the store and, uh, I mean, do you own seed? How many, how many, if you're not a gardener, you might have some flower seeds if you're a, if you're a flower gardener, but if you're not a vegetable gardener, you don't have any seeds. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're, if you're a vegetable gardener, even if, even if you go into the supermarket and you get some uh, winter squash off the shelf, you can take the seeds out of the winter squash and dry them or the tomato and dry them and plant those seeds and they'll make tomatoes for you or squash Mm -hmm. for you. But how many people are throwing away the seeds? All of us. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So start learning how to save those seeds because what they're doing is they're selling a seed that's hybrid And it means that they're controlling our life. Become a seed saver. Mm -hmm. Become a seed saver. That that is a very important issue right there. Become a seed saver. There are, you know, there are something like around 3,000 varieties of sweet potatoes in the world. Whoa. I didn't know that. And if you go into the grocery store, you're lucky to find two varieties on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And I have seven myself. So, you know, what I, I want to, and, you know, when you can grow sweet potatoes in just a few, in just three rows, I can grow enough sweet potatoes, three short rows, I can grow enough sweet potatoes to last me all winter, all year. And if I grow squash, I grew, I grew um, four vines out uh, on the uh, east end of my house on the downside of a big manure pile that I have put there from chickens, and uh, it was actually from goat and sheep. And uh, those four vines, it was under a shade tree too. Those four, four vines produced about 20 different large butter, uh, 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 butternut-type squash it's a butternut mm-hmm. squash called sucre and dewberry. It comes from France, and um, it's a it's very large and they they uh, save really well all winter. I've been you know if you cut one open, you might as well take uh, three quarters of it and put it in the refrigerator and wait because you're not going to go through it all in one meal. There's too much. I mean, there's a lot there, and so um, yeah, that that became a part of every meal pretty much during the winter and um uh, and plus you got it there for pies and all kinds of other things so yeah oh fantastic can mm-hmm. you send me a parcel with those seeds because i <laughs> i didn't know there are seven types of species of sweet potatoes and i love them to be honest yes. <laughs> make the two parcels once for me too <laughs> yes i'd be happy to <laughs> and, I, something- I, and i do I do send seeds around to different people. Yes, I do. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, something you said uh, resonated a lot with these two examples of a tractor and of a ship. Uh, I mean, of course, I know that was a metaphor, but also even thinking that, yeah, like with this tractor, yeah, like uh, we, it, it, on a, such a simple example, it shows us how much we're interconnected. Again, in the consumer society, we, yeah, we learn kind of, 
we, we were made to learn that we are kind of separate. As you said, it's like you go to the supermarket, you get everything there. It just, you feel so disconnected, so separate. But actually the separateness is an illusion because yeah, we are all so much interconnected. We're so much interdependent. Yeah, like you said, even with a tractor, you know, there were, it involves so many people, so many companies to make one or if we needed to repair one, then so many people are using it. You know, it's just like a small example and as we started talking on the topic of education, I think currently what lacks in our educational system is also this more holistic approach, showing our, our kids, showing children this interconnectedness, because what's happening now more and more that people are being focused on only one subject and all the other subjects like art and music and, you know, being in nature and learning everything you're telling us right now, you know, people are not learning that in schools anymore. People are not learning it anywhere anymore. It just, it feels like, you know, the kid is born and then he straight, you know, gets some profession that earns him money. And, I would like to ask you, how important do you think is to change the current educational system, to have a more holistic approach, to teach kids all variety of different, you know, disciplines and maybe something else that you think should be in the educational system in a perfect creative society? You see this pencil? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this pencil takes 45 people to make. Wow. Somebody has to make the metal that goes on the end that holds the eraser. Somebody has to make the eraser. Somebody has to cut the tree down. Somebody has mm -hmm. to sawmill it. There's a lot of people involved in making the pencil. So remember that. Okay. So <clears throat> what I want to say is this. I was raised in... Um, in a conservative Christian church. And um, I studied the Bible a lot, but not only that, I, I'm the kind of person that likes to look for truth. I like to look for original sources because it's just like water. Are we going to drink water from the Gulf of Mexico uh, out in the ocean where the river dumps out in the ocean? Or are we going to go upstream to the most purest water that we can find? And um, so uh, what we find is that the further downstream from the spring, spring, the spring comes forth out of the earth, you say, from nature. And um, when it goes out into the stream, then you have men putting chemicals into it. Uh, they're they're uh, they're chemi chemicals from all kinds of industries and things like that. Some of it is cleaned up, but there's a lot that's not, and uh, uh, that goes out into the fish and things like that. Okay, so um, I had to ask myself. You see, all books that are written by man are are books that are man made man-made books they're man-made ideas and they're written down but if you really want to know something go to the source and so like in a in a book for english they will say t-r-e-e -E, tree and mm -hmm. uh, and uh and we don't know what kind of a tree is except if a person says it's a walnut tree or a peach tree or an apple tree Mm -hmm. um, so, but in nature, we go out and we see a tree and there'll be an apple on it and there'll be a peach on it and there'll be, um, you know, pecans or nuts or different kinds on it, mm -hmm. or it might be an oak tree and it'll have some acorns on it. And so nature is speaking to us in symbols, just the same if they're living symbols just the same way as when we look at letters in an alphabet that tell us a story. And if we want to know something, the best thing to do is to go into nature. All medicines come from nature, originally. 
-hmm. Now, man has manufactured them synthetically and chemically. They have analyzed those things in plants, and they've said, well, how can I make money off this? And so they take it and go into a lab, and they start taking it apart and looking at and analyzing the chemical composition. And they say, okay, we can do this and do this and then make this drug. And this drug has certain side effects that are going to hurt you and possibly kill you. But you go out into nature and if you're a smart person, you're not going to just grab the first thing and eat the whole thing up because it's going to, maybe it might hurt you. And you know, you want to just take your time Maybe take a small leaf and see, rub it on your skin. Put it on your tongue, on the edge of your lip, and see if there's a reaction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then listen to somebody that is older than you, who's got some experience working with those natural things, and then you begin to learn what they're good for. Because there's all these things like dandelions that people are growing in their yard and they don't like them in their yard because it's not part of the lawn. It's a weed. And so we go down and we get some chemical and we spray it on there. And we're putting poison into the earth. Mm -hmm. And we're hurting ourselves. And we're hurting ourselves. It's coming back on us. We're doing it to ourselves. And, you know, we can, we can I mean, it's, it's one thing to do something in a small way. But I'm going to tell you, in the Vietnam War, I believe it was Monsanto made a chemical called Agent Orange, and they sprayed it all over the jungle so that it would defoliate the jungle. Mm -hmm. And that Agent Orange had an effect on many of the soldiers that were there. And they came home complaining of these different problems they were having. And the government denied it and denied it for a long time until a lot of them had died. And then they finally acknowledged it. That just tells you, you know, to give you another example, when uh, the Europeans came over from uh, into the uh, North America, one of the things that they did because they wanted to overcome the natives that were here, the people that were living close to nature, they wanted, they gave them blankets infected with smallpox. If the government will do that to other human beings, they'll do it to you and they'll do it to me. Now that doesn't mean I don't love my country, but there are some evil people everywhere and it's important that we wake up before it's too late mm -hmm. yeah. we're we're speaking now for generations yet to come and we're speaking for people who can't speak people that are on the street because they've lost their home people that are in another country that are starving people that are, are hurting in many, many ways. If we, don't, if we don't stand up for these people now while we have a chance, when will we ever? Are we waiting to go to prison before we think about it and wish we had? Now is the time to speak up. We have to grow a backbone. We have to, we have to set an example to the younger generation. They're looking to the older generation for somebody to teach them how to be, how to stand up. And, you know, if, if we're not excited about it, if we're not standing up, how do we expect them to? Mm -hmm. As you said, it is high time to yes. change our society. As you, you previously said, our human rights are being absolutely trumped, trampled on. Freedom of speech, yes. right to live, right to have safety, freedom, self-protection, everything. That's why... Yes. talking to people like you all over the world we realize it's time to build a better world it's time to build create a society and the 
here, I would like we watch a short video about eight foundations sure. of Creative Society. Yeah, and then we just to let those who are not familiar with them to get some idea, and then we will talk about it. Sure. That's eight pillars, eight foundations, we call them, of the Creative Society. And I know, Maroon, you are aware of them. So please tell us, what is your vision of Creative Society? <clears throat> I meant, uh, uh, one of the things that I uh, meant to include in this demonstration here uh, visually is... Um, I meant to include uh, some pictures of uh, brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story is that the saying is that the artist or the creative or the emotional person is on the right side of the brain. And the uh, mathematical and that kind of stuff is on the left side of the brain. And um, that's very interesting. And uh, what I want to uh, draw a point to is some people in, in my religious background, for instance, in Christianity, they would say, um, look at Adam and Eve. Eve um, tempted Adam, and it was because of Eve that Adam sinned and uh, so forth. And so uh, the woman tends to be more emotional, and so uh, you know, sh we, we don't want to put too much trust in her. You know, that's, that's the kind of thought there. And, but what I want to point out is, look at all the people that are left brain that have gotten us into this situation around the world. War. Murder. Bloodshed division, uh, ugliness in, in the extreme, human trafficking, all that stuff that's going on in the world. That, there's a lot of people that are in high places that are in charge of, of uh, allowing uh, heroin, cocaine, things like that to come into the United States. And because they're getting a lot of money, they just overlook it, but in on the media and in, in the press, they kind of say all kinds of pretty things. But um, on the right side of the brain, there is this creative side, and and you have the woman, the emotional woman. How many mothers want to have their children die in a foreign war? in a foolish war. That's not a very good thing to be excited about. And um, if we're going to change things, we need to have a balance between the left and right brain so that emotion, and this, this is something that needs to be taught in the educational system. Uh, when I first went to my high school, there was no art course in the school. Uh, I was doing artwork at home and bringing my artwork and showing it to the teachers and to my fellow classmates. But by the end of the school, by the end of the year, 
uh, they had a, an art class. And uh, I was chosen as the most talented of the senior class at that time. And um, now, today, 50 years later, they have two classrooms dedicated full-time to art. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, so, so it, you know, what we don't want to do is we don't want to have people going out into the world without an appreciation for art, whether in any form, because when we're talking about designing a landscape or whether we're talking about cre recreating the world, when, when I first moved onto this property, which is a three acre piece of property, there was a lot of big trees, but there were a lot of small trees and brush all growed up in, in the middle of it. And it didn't look pretty at all. And I wondered to myself, what in the world am I gonna do with this place? Uh, there was a pond, a couple of ponds out in the very back, but it was all grown up. You couldn't hardly walk around it either. And you could hardly stand up. There was hardly any level place. And so uh, I took my tractor and backhoe and, and started uh, doing a lot of leveling and changing up, it all up. And, and, and I was saying to myself, I'm going to turn this into a little Garden of Eden. <laughs> and so as creators a part of a creative society this sets as an individual i'm doing this to my property planting flowers i'm uh, putting ponds in goldfish all kinds of things like that and and a water flow and so that when people look at it they go wow and one of the things one of the first things i did there was a big tree a big red oak tree that was dead and I was wondering to myself, what am I going to do with this thing? And I, I ended up uh, taking my backhoe and cutting all the roots around the base of it loose from the ground. And then I pulled the thing over and I cut it off real up high, the, the trunk real up high, cut all the limbs off and everything. And then I had a friend that, uh, that had a big uh, forklift. And uh, he came and took the root ball and raised it up high in the air I had dug a big four foot hole and we planted that tree upside down next to the highway. And up on top of that tree on the root ball, I had all these flowers and vines growing down and people were stopping on the side the, on the highway with traffic going and taking pictures of it. So, so what I'm trying to say to you, what I'm trying to say to you, what we're doing here, you know, the idea is, where you are, brighten the corner where you are. Mm -hmm. And then together we can brighten the whole world. But we've got to have that first vision. It all begins with a person, the individual. You've, we've all got to be creators. We all have to be creators in a positive way, not creators in an ugly way. If you ask me, like somebody said on, in answer to that question about what do you think is beautiful, this one person, Danette, said, um, I was always taught that everything was beautiful, so it's really hard to figure out what isn't. And then I said, well, maybe we should ask the other question is, what do you think is ugly? And that <laughs> would tell you what's beautiful. And she admitted that was true. Person. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Again, we need some contrast to to <laughs> to <Yes>. define things. <laughs> yes, that's a for shade. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've just watched a video about eight foundations of the Creative Society, and Mervin, I would like to ask you: Do you think implementation of these eight foundations will help make a beautiful, you know, harmonious, supportive, wonderful world, wonderful society for all people? And maybe some of these foundations resonate with you more than the others? And there are certain ones that do, but um, what I, um, I think that one of the things that needs to be kept in mind, because when we're talking about uniting people under one kind of banner um there has to be a continued discussion a good discussion because even the um i can see that 
some people would look at some of these ideas and they would say, well, I don't know. I don't mess. I've got, I've got a million acres. I'm not interested in, in, um, in getting rid of any of it. <laughs> I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to lose any of it, you know, because to them, all that, all that represents wealth and power. Um, something that, that's interesting to me, um, I think it's interesting that there are some people that money doesn't mean really anything to them. What they're really more interested in is power, influence. And uh, when and a good example of that is what has happened in our economy this last year when the world has been shut down all at once. Mm -hmm. That right there tells you who has got power. Who is pulling the strings that caused that to happen? That, that's crazy. And uh, if we don't wake up to what's going on right there, because that setting, uh, that interrupted the economy. That put people out on the street. That, that put people in debt. That, uh, that is, uh, there's a lot of people that are going to die because of this. And it isn't because of the COVID. There's, they're going to die because of the poor economy and starvation, things like that. They're going to die because of those kind of things. And who has the power? Who, who, who has that kind of power to reach down to Australia, to Africa, to India, and tell everybody, uh, you know, go home. You're not going to work today. If you're going to do anything, it has to be on the Internet. Well, guess what? On the internet, we can keep an eye on you. We know what's going on. We know what you're thinking. We know what you're saying, what you're planning. <laughs> See? Uh, but, you know, if I've got a neighbor and I decide that I'm going to uh, make a trade, I'm going to give him some vegetables so that I've got uh, some eggs in return or some cheese or some bread, the government doesn't need to know that stuff. That's something that happens between me and my neighbor. And it doesn't involve the dollar. Mm -hmm. See? And if I give somebody my seed, or if I give somebody a painting or a print or whatever, I'm giving them my time. I'm giving them something that's valuable. This is just as valuable as a dollar bill. I will give you an example. A, a $20 bill, if you look at it, there's all kinds of artwork on it. And if I was to do a picture of that dollar bill, a $20 bill, I could end up in prison because I was kind of like counterfeiting, right? That's what they would think. <laughs> but I can do a picture like this and, char and make a print and sell that print for $20, and I'm a famous artist all of a sudden. <laughs> Time now is, think, about, yeah. think about that. Isn't that something? <laughs> you, you're raising interesting subjects. Yeah. Interesting, and All I, would, right. I would sit and listen to you endless. But as you mentioned, time is important. And unfortunately, yes. we're running out of time. Sure. <laughs> but okay. Before we start wrapping up, what would you like to wish to all our viewers here and now? And of course, to proceed our discussions about creative society, we would like you to nominate her or him for, to, to know their vision of the creative society, if you have somebody on your mind. Yes. Um, I want to, you know, I really want to extend my heartfelt um, warmth and good feeling and goodwill toward my um, fellow Earth sojourners. I've got friends in uh, Iran, and I've got friends all over the world, people in Africa that I know that I've met on the Internet because uh, it's a social media, you know, and I wanted to develop my social skills. And uh, you learn things from listening to other people. And one of the things that I think that I think everybody should do is they should shake the hand of John John Dye. John John Dye is on YouTube, mm -hmm. and um, he is a, a gardener, and he has a lot of wisdom. And I would like to 
to recommend him be a person that everybody uh, interviews and, uh, you know, go, go look at his channel, yep. John John Die. Life is Easy mm-hmm. on YouTube. He's a good dude. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We're already looking forward to meeting him. And we have been talking about the Creative Society and about inviting other people. And probably our viewers are wondering whether they can be on one of such live streams with us. And I would just like to mention that anyone, absolutely anyone, can join the project of the Creative Society. And you can be on the live streams uh, as the one we're having right now, or you can join in any other way. You can visit visit alatrayunites.com website, the one you see right now on the screen. And to join the project, you just press on the red button join and our volunteers will contact you right away. And no effort here is too small or insignificant because when we put all our efforts together, together we can create a beautiful, a wonderful world. But it is a common effort. Even if each of us does a lot, still, you know, it's not enough to change the whole world. But even if each of us does a tiny little bit, puts a tiny little bit effort, but all of us are going to do this, all of us are going to join, we can change the world so much faster. Because we all feel, especially in these times, we all feel that we need the change. The world needs a change. What what society is now this consumer format is a dead end there is no way out of it there is no way to develop it anymore we need a totally different approach to everything and this approach is creative society so we we ask you to join we ask you to go to the website learn more about the project and join us join us in this wonderful effort to make a beautiful world for every single human being I wanted to thank you, uh, Anne, for this uh, discussion, interview, and uh, for you, Marina. You're, you're thank been, you very both, much. Both of you girls have been very sweet. And, and I want to extend my thanks to, to Julia for uh, recommending me to be on this channel. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. As Anne said, we are stronger together, absolutely. Yes. And uh, I would like also to thank you all guys for your time, time, time is valuable, <laughs> for your efforts today to bring people a bit closer together, hope more like-minded will join us. We, abs- we don't need any money from you, we're absolutely <laughs> voluntary based. We just need you to start, change yourself, be more caring, be more helpful helpful to each other listen to each other don't just stop being selfish to be honest i was the same i probably still is so it's a hard work for me <laughs> <laughs> and also i would like we would like to get you involved in our upcoming online international conference which is called life after death uh, fictions and facts Uh, The purpose of the conference is, of course, to answer the question we all have asked ourselves in the past. What is the purpose of my life and what awaits me after the death of my body, physical body? So please join us on the 22nd May 2021 (laughs) and we will answer your questions. And here's a trailer for you. Thank you again. It was enjoy- enjoyable, absolutely. I'm speechless now and I have so many <laughs> to think about. <laughs> Thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Anne. Thank, Thank you. Ch- Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, viewers. We love you. Stay with us. <laughs>and eyewitnesses will seek the answer all together. Does reincarnation exist? 
fear of death. What is its nature? How do we, alive people, know what death is? Who benefits from hiding facts about a person's after-death fate? Human consciousness is outside the body. The prophets knew the truth about the afterlife fate of humans. What does science say? Is the state of heaven and hell explained by physics? What are we here for? Answers to the most important questions for every person. May 22nd, 2021, International Online Conference. Life after death, fiction and facts.